and let's see what works better for people. And what works is tension. It's creating the tension in the right places. And you, were, you know what happens? The position looks good. Once they find the right tension, the position comes to them. The difference is that position that comes to them is their position, not mine, not the one I want, the one they found. And that's the correct position. So if I teach the right tension, they find the right position. That was Julian Pinot, and you're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Lost Empire Herbs, and I want to share with you how to get a free bag of pine pollen through Lost Empire here today. Quickly first, I used to think herbs was just Jinko Biloba you got at the drugstore, but after being introduced to compounds such as the Phoenix Formula through Lost Empire, I've been a regular consumer of Lost Empire Herbs for over four years now. The Phoenix Formula instantly changed my viewpoint on herbalism. I was literally buzzing with energy after my first dose. Within two weeks, I was noticing strength improvements in the weight room. And it's been fun expanding uh, my herbalism regime to different things throughout the Lost Empire Herb store. Uh, In Phoenix Formula in particular, along with Shiliagit, which is a very popular herb for strength and performance, you also have pine pollen, which is a superfood. It offers a variety of energy, health, and performance benefits. And you can grab that free bag of pine pollen with the modest cost of shipping by heading to justflypinepollen.com. If you want to check out other herbs that I enjoy through Lost Empire, you can head to lostempireherbs slash justfly and grab 15% off your order. I can't recommend Lost Empire enough, and I really enjoy the fact that I've been able to partner with them through this podcast for as long as I have. So be sure to check that out. Let's get on to the rest of the show. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. Great to have you here. Our guest today is strength and performance coach, Julian Pinot. Julian is the founder of StrongFit, which started as a gym and is now a full educational program for coaches and fitness enthusiasts alike. Julian has a broad sporting background, competing in a variety of disciplines, from competitive swimming to MMA to strongman and more. He has three decades of experience coaching a wide variety of athletes and individuals, and Julian has a fascinating ability to observe and assess human movement patterning. He's been a mentor to previous podcast guest DJ Murakami and has a huge wealth of knowledge on all things training and performance. On the show today, Julian will share his core views, his first principles of training athletes on the level of torque, tensioning, and how we can fit these tensioning patterns to the needs of athletes in the realm of speed, strength, and resiliency from injury. Julian is a fascinating individual, he's a wealth of knowledge, and you're sure to walk away from this show with a lot of ideas on best practices in training the athlete in front of you. Let's get to episode 343 with coach Julian Pinnell. Dude, that used to be the thing. 90 kilos, Mm -hmm. ooh, 200 pounds, right? You have 20 ladies doing it at the CrossFit Games, it's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's, do you think that that is all, how much do you think that is, um, if you had to divide it up, like between the training and then the product culture, you know, I guess it's hard to say exactly, you know, but, um, it's hard to say, but the fact is you always had very driven women who are getting stronger and everything. And the results are backing up the, the point that like, you know, we always knew women needed more volume than men. Right. But it was hard to tell exactly. Mm. All right. So. How far are we pushing this? The Chinese are lifting, are training their women with far more volume than the men. For example, less intensity, more volume. We always knew that. But the problem is, when it came to lifting, it was either a men's program or a bodybuilding one. And until Dave Castro decided to kill women at the CrossFit Games, we didn't know how much they could take, honestly. Mm. And a lot of it is because men's coaches, you know, like women are different than men when you coach them, right? Men get angry, women cry. And... Uh, most coaches have, have a difficulty pushing women correctly on both sides, right? Women responding to it and men knowing when to push, when not to. And so Dave Castro didn't give a shit. And he's like, all right, I'm going to ask you to do more and better every single year for 10 years straight. And women have responded in the way that I don't think anybody predicted. That's so interesting. So it's a culture as well, right? Because it's a culture of like, I don't care, push. In a way, like I see my wife, the amount of work she can do, like he would not, like I trained Valerie Vobol for years, right? And 
I got to tell you, the, the learning curve for me in the first six months was insane because I was like, really? You can do that, eh? All right. I would put her through monstrous workouts and she come back the next day going, oh, that was fun. And recovered in 48 hours where it would take me five days. And so I had to change my own mindset to, well, no, 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 no. They can do it. They can take it. They can recover from it in a way that I did not suspect because that's not what men, that's not how men would respond. Yeah, that's so interesting. You know, I was, I, two things come to mind. One is the idea of the, well, yeah, with the volume, like women being able to handle more volume mm-hmm. than, than men. But even, um, I heard somewhere that even within like human reproduction, like the male sperm, I guess, are faster, but they fizzle out faster in the birth canal. Whereas the I female, be surprised. The yep. female yeah, sperm yeah. are like tougher, like they can, they can last mm-hmm. longer. So it's like a race of different proportions. But I also think about, oh, yeah, and yeah. look at what the body goes through through nine months of pregnancy, the changes he has to take. Like, that's why, like, when they say women can take pain more than men, it was like, well, it depends which pain, mm-hmm. right? Passive pain they can take. Acute pain, not maybe not as much. So this acute versus chronic, right? This, they, those are different things. But if you look at chronic stress, men can they take a lot. Right? So men can take a lot of acute. We see the same thing in, in aggressiveness response, like sympathetic response. Men are very good at acute responses. On the, on the, on the more, like, constant stress i can take it like women are just they just can take almost anything right they can adapt to any situation mentally or physically in a way that a man would right away need to go into a full fight women will just absorb that shit like it's candy and so we see that with for example like uh, you put men through arm wraps and they do well you know as many reps as possible Mm -hmm. so 10 minutes as many reps as you can and men will do it but if you put uh, women on imams you know like on the minute uh you do let's say so I've done that experience many times with women. I take the weight for, let's say, a six rep max. So I did that with my wife. We do two to three sets of five to six rep max, right, for a squat program. So typical men program, right? Uh, at the time, it's 100 kilo for six. All right. But, you know, at four, it gets rough. And five and six, things start moving. So her knee starts flinching a little bit on, on the fifth rep, and she has to push on the sixth. By the third set, she's doing four reps, and she's not liking the fact that her form is being challenged in a way where she feels she's failing, right? She's not winning, right? That's a very women's way of looking at it. For me, it'd be like, no, you reach failure. That's the point. Uh Uh-uh, that's not winning. That's failing. So what we do instead is we put her through two reps on the minute at 100 kilos. She went for uh, 12 minutes, no issues whatsoever. So the interesting thing is if you look in 12 minutes, she did 24 reps. With the other way in 12 minutes, she only did, she did about like 15, right? So you would say, well, yeah, but once she pushed to failure, they once she didn't. In the meantime, she did more reps with the same weight, but every set, she won the set because she never got challenged to her form breaking down. So she left the training session going, I won every single set. I feel amazing. Next week, she did the same thing with 105 instead of 100 kilos. Whereas my way was just crushing her every time because she felt she could never win. Mm. How interesting is that, right? And so she ends up doing more work. So now she can do 120 kilo for two reps for 10 minutes in a year. So just ridiculous point. She did uh, four reps with 120 kilo paused with like one, two, three go up in a year. It's a crazy progress, right? And we did it through imams because she does not approach it the same way as do three steps to failure. That does not work for her. I had many, many, many women that face the same thing. Winning matters. Yeah, yeah. The feeling that you win. Um, I know the late mm-hmm. Louis Simmons, that was the thing. I One of my training partners had worked in the West Side Gym for a little bit and he had said, Louis, yeah. one of Louis' big things was win the workout. Find a way to win the workout. And I mean, that was a group I will of agree fully. Male, yeah. males, but I just always think about the perception we have about our training being such a critical factor, almost even on some level. I mean, it's complex, right? Like with CrossFit, is it the culture? Is it the workouts that's led to all these you know, insane outputs right. by the, or what complex factor? But I think that it's undeniable that how we perceive how we did in the workout is going to yes. impact massively how our physiology actually responds. Mass- massively. And this is where one of the biggest things for me when it comes to performance is understanding that we are still dealing with humans first. There is an oversimplification of training that happens, right? When it comes to the fitness industry where they're 
when they're saying like, do this movement, do that movement. All right, so let's let's break that down a little bit. Look at the form police. Yes. <laughs> right, the people like the perfect form police. They're always skinny and weak. Yeah. Have you noticed on YouTube? Oh yeah. I'm it, like, it, dude, you're a skinny, you're a skinny fucker. You weigh 170 pounds. Like, why are you? I mean, like you never competed in, yes, you look great, but welcome to genetics, right? You have a six pack. I'm like, I hope so. You weigh 170 pounds. But the, they're always weak and skinny. If you look at the strong dudes, they have their own form. They found what works for them. Like it's, it's, it's a work, but like oversimplification leads to bad things. And when it comes to training people, they're humans first. So yes, winning the workouts, going your attitude in a workout, I think Louis Simmons would agree with, my, with me on that one. Your attitude toward lifting matters a lot. Like try to get under a 500-pound squat. And this is like a max box jump. You better be in the right mindset because otherwise the weight is going to bury you. Right. So the attitude matters. If you go into a workout where every single time you feel like you lost, forget the hormonal levels and all of that. Just from an attitude perspective, you are not going to be successful in the long run. Yeah. But the way. No way. Who wants to lose every time? Yeah, with the form police too, it's almost you think about what are the factors that we gauge if we won the workout. And if you have that form police mentality, oh, did I hit all these? And yeah, you don't want to lift with. I mean, that's I know we'll get into that. What good form is and what yeah. actually produces good form and the body's way of producing right. an ideal exactly. form. Exactly. But it's, exactly. But it's almost like we right. It's that exactly. We live in a world where we kind of have a lot of manufactured ideas of good form. Like, well, this is good form. That's exactly. good form. And it may not be what that person's body ultimately was going to use its own intelligence to produce. And then you have this artificial set of checks to of good form. And now we weigh Uh that. Oh, do we check this off? Do we check spending all that mental energy when there's there's so many like deeper centers of what wins the workout? And I think powerlifting with Louis is easy. You know, did I lift a certain weight or not, or a certain in a certain manner? And did I set up the workout to achieve that? So yeah, I think the. Yeah, with the form police too. It's, it's just interesting. Tension over your position, right? They're teaching you positions. There is no such thing. Position will change. If you go to the World Championship of uh, Powerlifting, go to the IPF, look at a video, look at the squats, a perfect example. And you will not see two people squatting the same, even at the world class level. Take all the world champions, right? Men, women, put them all together. You will not find two people squatting the same way. It's crazy. Everybody, you know, some people will lean forward like crazy. Some people will squat Olympic weightlifting style or whatever, but none of them will squat the same way. But but they're all squatting world records. So what does that tell you? Like, I mean, like they found the form for them. The tension is usually the same. The position is not because you have different leverages. You have different, I mean, different strength, different weaknesses. What matters is tension, not position. But how am I selling tension? I cannot. So I have to sell position. And so that's where the phone police comes in is they get to take someone, a, a, a video of a guy who lifts maybe in an unusual way, an orthodox technique or whatever that works great for him, but it, it's not something probably that should be applied to the general public. And then they're going to de- deconstruct that one and then criticize him for an hour. There's an entire ecosystem in the fitness industry that is built on destroying other people to make yourself look good. Right. And so usually it's like they take a guy and then they criticize the form. Sometimes, yes, that person has poor form. Sometimes you're just not understanding what you're looking at. Yeah, I think it's you look at what is the most easy to scale in the modern fitness world. And some of the easiest things to scale are one, telling people what they're doing wrong. (laughs) Say whatever you could make up a lot movement. You could do a movement screen. You could do everything. You could. Yeah. And you can find endless nitpicking. But then another easy thing to scale is positions because that's so easy. You instantly feel like, oh, I got it. You know, I got the keys. I got this position. I'm going to have everybody do it. And it's much easier than going a few layers deeper into how our human engines work. And so I, I would do I, it. Is, oh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I, I was I was agreeing. Like I would just for anecdotal evidence, like I posted a video where I'm doing dumbbell rows with 100 kilo, right? So 220 dumbbell that they have at the gym. Right. So I'm like, ooh, like, you know, I did only five reps because it's heavy. But I'm like, hey, five, six reps at 100 kilos. I build up to it. I'm super happy. And all the comments were like, oh, yeah, that's poor form. I'm like, dude, it's a hundred kilos. Like it challenges my obliques. It ch- challenges everything. It's not just, it's not a lat exercise anymore. It's an entire body exercise. Mm. And uh, my shoulder were, wanted to move. So I have to control it. Yes, the form looked better with 90 kilos. But the point of the video was like, 
look, first of all, I'm still doing it. And second of all, look at the buildup to get to be able to handle the weight. Right. There was all that. But that, if you want to nit, nitpick someone doing dumbbell rows with 100 kilos, it's not that hard. Because trust me, it's not going to look perfect I, unless you weigh, you know, 400 pounds and then you're uh, Brian Shaw. You're going to, it's not going to look perfect either. That's easy to do. Right. But I could do the same video with 80 kilo and looking perfect. Yes, but I'm not going to get the results that I do lifting the 100 kilo dumbbell. So if I wanted to sell something, I would just show the 80 kilo dumbbell for 10 reps with accelerating the form. But that would not get me to 100 kilo. What gets me to 100 kilo is busting my ass on every mm -hmm. set. And sometimes the last rep is not going to look perfect. I would like it to be perfect, but it's not going to happen. Because as long as the tension remains where it should be, that's okay. You connect the muscle, but then push. My biggest problem with the form police is that they get people in a place where they don't push anymore. Because, ooh, I'm, you know, my form is breaking down. Like, is it? Or are you just getting a little bit tired? Like, can you just coax an, an extra rep? Like, I mean, like, obviously, don't hurt yourself. But where's that line? At least can we have a conversation about where that line is, right? With the form police, there is none. The second you deviate by one degree, that's it, you're out. I disagree because it leads to a place where you don't push anymore. Yeah, it's interesting to think about the modern world we live in, and the world is certainly accelerating faster and faster these days. <laughs> it has been for a little while, but you know, video being more, more and more common, especially since smartphones and everyone has a camera and everyone yeah. has a video, and you contrast that with the old school strongman, which of which so many feats have never mm -hmm. been and probably never will be replicated. Yeah. And you know, strongman isn't as popular as it was, you know, back in the day. I don't think. I mean, some people still. I mean, you probably could tell me better, but I feel like. You know, there wasn't obviously the form police back then. Like, if someone bending a bar, like, yeah. oh, you bent that bar all wrong. <laughs> that was completely wrong. <laughs> you shouldn't have done that. It's it's kind of funny to think right. how we've gone from internal, uh, just a you know, we've gone from this internal and feeling and probably being more connected to what we're doing to this world where there's more, there is more visual, which is cool. I mean, I love going over video and people sprinting and jumping and going into that, but I also am very aware that I don't need to tell the athlete everything about that visually because there's certain things I don't want them to fixate on. And so, I, yeah, I'm just curious on your thoughts on that, like the old school, maybe the how things have changed right. over time with all that. So th there was a good thing with social media before the form police became too powerful was that it showed you that you had to work harder. Because, you know, like you're taking a day off and then you're on social media and then your competitor is working and he's doing more weight than you. And then there's, oh, well, then I need to. And then so there's an entire culture that started to push. By the way, CrossFit being the number one on that one, too far. Mm -hmm. we, could, we could argue that point. So sometimes way too far, the anxiety started to go way up. But that constant posting of workout was lighting a fire on your people's asses. Like there's no question there. And it made you train a little bit harder and do that. So now... Did that lead to abuse on certain things? Yes, of course it did. In the world of strongmen, you saw people trying to get bigger all the time, you know, like unfortunately using, sacrificing their health to get bigger and stronger, stuff like that, because there was that constant push. But at the same time, the weights kept going up. So, like, remember when a 400 kilo deadlift was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Now it's like, now they're all chasing 500. So, you know I mean, like the, the, the social media pushed in that sense. The problem is, I think, for the general population, it was a disaster because now they just don't know what to do anymore. Like it's instead of going to the gym and learning to lift. Remember that where you spent two months on a new movement, right? On learning to do dumbbell incline presses, let's say. Right. So you set up and then the first two weeks, you're like, oh, like I feel my shoulders a lot. I don't feel my upper pec. By week three, you're like, oh. I'm starting to feel like muscle right here. Oh, is that what this is? And then you keep reading Flex magazine. And now you're two months in and you're starting to feel like it's a train on rails. I mean, like, hey, I'm starting to feel the movement. And then a month later, you start to have upper pecs. And now six months later, you're doing actually decent weight. And you're that used to be, I will learn to lift. And now instead of six months, it's six days. Because now you're checking the videos and someone is telling you stretch and contract and do this and do that. And you're not sure how you feel, but the guy... So now we're all doing someone else's form, someone else's experience yeah. about lifting. I got to tell you, you can't learn to swim on the table. At some point, you got to jump in the water. And honestly, like, you might drown a bit at first. Yeah, but you're going to learn to swim. It's a little bit that. So I don't want people to get hurt. But at the same time, like, you got to... You got It's a craft. You got to be in the gym. You got to lift. You got to learn. You, you can only learn through mistakes. 
right? That's what kills me with the form police is that it's treating mistakes as evil. Does that make sense? Mm. You know what I mean, like, oh my God, you can't do that. I'm like, no, probably not. But at the same time, listen, is listening to me the best thing for you? Because you, you might shy away from some techniques that might be very valuable for you because we will never squat the same. We will never do that. So what I liked about Strongman, for example, is the fact that he was low skill, right? Yeah. So like, let's be honest, a stone is not going to take me that long to show you how to do a stone. After that, you just get stronger. So then you just grab the thing and then you spend a lot of time under tension. That's it. And, and there's a beauty to that that we're starting to lose a bit. Like there's so much. Mm -hmm. The problem with the foreign police is there's so much criticism that at some point you're not going to even try anymore. Yeah, that's that's one of the things that I really I've been thinking about a lot the last few years. And then one of the coaches I, I've learned a lot from, uh, mostly from people actually who learned from him, was a guy named Jay Schrader, who's his the core like package of his training is a lot of just body weight isometric holds. And I, he'll have it where you're like pulling into the bottom, but there's not a lot mm -hmm. of technique. It's mostly just like, you know, keep a good upright posture and disposition, you know, like you're Superman right. or Superwoman. And yeah. and it's all internal. And it's like, it's not like you're yeah. going to be putting a lot of the success on, oh, did I do this right? Did I do this angle right? And, you know, I think even too about the strongman stuff and the I tell you, honestly, it was a DJ and then your work. I, I, I went and bought a sandbag a few weeks ago just because I was like, yeah, I want to. It's winter too. I'm like, it's winter here. I kind of want to do something that's. I'm not sprinting as much in the winter. I'm just trying to kind of be more seasonal. I'm like, yeah. I'll throw do some yeah. sandbag for my hinging, hinge stuff. And, and it's been awesome. And part, one of the things I appreciate about that is just, like you said, it's like we've, like we've evolved to do, like this is in our history, like picking something up and, you know, gr I'm lifting just... it or even throwing it over your shoulder. Like you do it and you feel like, I don't need someone to coach me on this. This is in my system. <laughs> like, you know, this is here. I this is in my blood. I can do it right away. Go. Yeah. And then you can go fast. You can do things. That's interesting because my wife is a sprinter. She was a Dutch champion. And so the way I rehab her hammy was using sandbag carries like heavy because she would go on the ball of the foot and go very fast. But suddenly she felt the hammies, the glutes. Mm. I didn't have to say anything because if I had to try to isolate the hammies for her because she tore almost off the bone badly from 14 to 16, she, she tore uh, three times mm. and never did the rehab correctly. So you can imagine her form started to falter. So she gets to 20 and then there's a sleuth of issues. And I was trying to isolate the hammy at first just to test, and she just can't go there. There's so much trauma in the hammy. I mean, she can't go there. The, the thing we found that worked the best was grab a heavy sandbag, go there and back as fast as you can. The first time she fell forward and face planted because she was going too fast, but then she learned to control the weight on the ball of the foot, and that made her hammies and cramp on the side that was injured every single time. I was like, all right, mm -hmm. winning, score. We do that every time. Within six to eight weeks, the hammy started connecting better, even on the sprint drills, and then off we go. I didn't have to do anything, which is, as a coach, it's winning every time. The less I got to talk, the better we're doing. Yeah, it's like you, I mean, this, <laughs> I don't know if this mental construct exists, it just so pops in my head. It's like on one level, you got the form police, and then the other extreme is just caveman, doing caveman things or whatever, right. you know, and like, where are you at yep. any time on that spectrum? You know, I, I mean, you don't necessarily I think have to be all the way on the caveman side, but at least, you know, if you're Not if you're too way. far to the if you're getting too far away from the instinctual uh, like tensioning of the body. And and I'd like for you to go into that as well, like your process, uh, because maybe I'm sure it'll come up, you know, more and more throughout our talk. Yeah. And yeah, I, I talked a little bit with DJ Mirakami for people who listen to that podcast. But I'm curious with your journey into tension being that originating point of, of technique. And yes. so tell me your, your story. When did that start? getting on your radar and you start to see the body and technique from that perspective and then explain a little bit more right. about those torques. So th the thing is, I, I always had two kinds of people. I had the pro athlete type level and I had your regular person, like about as low on the athletic background as you can get. I think my greatest job as a coach was a friend of mine called Michael Mann. Michael Mann came to me at 60. Because he had his kid very late in life. He was 46, 47. And he wanted to be around when the kid uh, was going to be 40. So he was like, all right. He had never trained a day in his life. You know, he's the guy with the knees are thicker than the legs. You've seen that guy, right? Like super skinny and stuff yeah. like that. So he's going down the, the, the stairs and he has to hold on the trail. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> right? So first day, 
I made him squat to a 24 inches box and back up, and he's still falling on the box. So no tension in the hammies and glutes or nothing. I'm like, all right, so work three, four years forward, and he's doing that, that pastor did three reps with a sandbag squat of 180. So he picked mm-hmm. up a 180 pound sandbag and squatted like three reps, breaking parallel and every time. That's my greatest job as a yeah. coach, I think. And one time when I saw that, he could do a front squat with a sandbag, like uh, 100 pounds for like a few reps. So, you know, great form. I put him on a barbell back squat. And I am ashamed to this day that I let him do the fourth and fifth rep. By the way, 135, way below what he can squat. But, oh my God. He, like, you know, when you make the face and, <laughs> and you're like, he's going to die. He's going to die. And I should have stopped him at rep three. He didn't hurt himself, but by luck, not anything else, right? And I'm like, all right, barbell back squat, never again. <laughs> he asked me, like, how did I look? Awesome. We're going to go back on the same bag over there. And then he never squatted a barbell ever again after that because he could not. Position was horrible. I was not going to spend five years teaching him the barbell back squat. I don't see the point where he's making so much progress yeah. with the same bag. So, so I was like, all right, so what am I looking for for Michael? He just needs to be healthy. He's getting stronger. This is someone who started with no pull-ups and one push-up, who now can do 13 pull-ups and 30 push-ups unbroken. What else do you want? Mm-hmm. And I did that with the most simplistic program there was because it worked for him. So that also taught me as a coach was like, dude, like, you, you know, like in the uh, Empire Strike Back, the Star Wars movie? Oh, yeah. When uh, Luke is on the on Dagobah and he's about to enter the dark cave, and he asks Yoda, "What will I find in there?" and Yoda tells him, "Whatever you bring with you." Hmm. That was a lesson that I had to learn as a coach. He's like, "Are you making squat a barbell because it makes you look good, or because it's necessary for the athlete?" Right. So that led me to go like, get your my own ego out of the door, and let's see what works better for people. And what works is tension. Is creating the tension. In the right places, and you were, you know what happens? The position looks good. Once they find the right tension, the position comes to them. The difference is that position that comes to them is their position, not mine, not the one I want, the one they found. And that's the correct position. So if I teach the right tension, they find the right position. If I teach them what I think is the right position, they might not find the right tension. So that it's things like that that really shape me as a coach, right? And then so for me, all problem needs to be taken care of from a first principle perspective. There is a difference between first principles and oversimplifications, right? It's, it's another podcast, but those are not the same thing. So for me, I always try to break it down in first principles. I was like, all right, so let me study movement and let's see what first principle I can get out of those. Because we're all talking about a movement. What, what does that mean? So for example... Since I was very much involved in CrossFit, I am coming across a problem. I see a lot of shoulder issues, right? Not like snap, but like constant pain, you know, things like that. So not what they not what they call necessarily injury, but every six weeks, they can snatch for, like, say, a week or two because the shoulder is hurting so much. All right. You might not call that an injury, but it's a problem nonetheless. It's not an acute one, but there's all obviously a faulty movement pattern. Right. And so... All I hear from my physio crowd is external rotation, external torque. Create rotation. Yeah, yeah. That, um, that like outward screwing of the, yeah, it's not, it's video right. or body only, but the outward screwing of the shoulder as your arms overhead. Yeah. Right. Or as they call active shoulders and all that bullshit. And I'm like, <laughs> all right. So every time I talk to a physio, he's explaining to me that the shoulder has to screw in an external rotation. I'm like, okay. I have a question. When I punch, that's not what I do. I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't count. I'm like, all right, when I throw a ball, that's not what I do. It doesn't count. Okay, when I swim, it's not what I do. Okay, when I push a car, it's not what I do. When I push a sled, it's not what I do. And then, and then, and then, and I'm going through every single movement that I can think of where I'm pressing, and none of them involve an external rotation in the way, like screwing the shoulder into the socket, as they say. I'm like, all right, so can I ask why? None of the natural movement, which means basically any sports there is out there, requires me to do that. And to this day, I still haven't heard an answer. So I was like, all right. So second point, if there's such a thing as external torque, which means, you know, that external rotation, most likely there's going to be an internal torque. 
Like, why would the joint only move one way? Right, so you're supposed to create strength externally rotating, right? So with the strength going toward the outside, but I'm like, how about strength going toward the inside? Like, outside of Kung Fu movie, right? Have you ever seen someone punching, screwing his <laughs> fist out? Right, outside of Kung Fu movies, people. Right, what's stronger, a low kick or like a, that fucking bullshit Kung Fu movie kick outside? Does it sound, does it sound strange that most movement involves tension toward the center of the body and not away from it. Right. So, you know, and so then you start to look at an anatomy, uh, anatomy chart. And they tell you the pec muscle is an internal rotator of the humerus. I'm sure you read that. Right. So do you know what a pec stick is? You know, like stuff from the 80s where they've been, you know, like... It's, yeah, the, it's torx, like a, the torque a, stick, like the... the yeah, yeah, yeah. I try yeah, to describe it so everyone knows. It's like the little like spring stick that you like bend like a U, you know, for everyone that, who's not... Mr. T. That, Remember like Mr. T when he was <laughs> doing that? Right. So now you take one of those sticks and you bend it, not in a U shape, but in a, let's say, rainbow shape, right? So the, the yeah, thing goes to yeah, the top, right? You, yeah. Right. Are you going to involve your pec when you bend that thing? Yes, very much so. But yet you have external rotation of the humerus. So I'm like, all right, so you have adduction, but you also have external rotation. So it seems that to engage the pec, it's not the rotation of the humerus internal or external that matters. It's the adduction movement. So tension over position, basically. So it's not rotation that matter. Is what is the direction of the of the toe, right? So I started to break it down more and more like that. And to me, it seemed like a simple idea of either all movement go toward the center of the body or away from it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right? So adduction brings everything toward the center. And then, for example, a jump brings everything outside. So center of the body being... The like three inches below the navel point. If you look at uh, Leonardo da Vinci, the Vitruvian man, that's what you see mathematically speaking. You can always center the body right below the navel, which is what the Japanese call the Hara point. And it's an energy point that you see in most Asian cultures. Right. That's the center of the body. So to me, it seems that either you go to one, that point or away from it. So look at a bench press. You have adduction of the elbows as toward the center. Or you have a push press, the first phase, which means you explode out away from the center, and then you go back toward the inside, trying to stabilize and locking out the weight. So if you start to look at it from that perspective, I'm not talking about rotation. I'm talking about where the tension is going, which is not the same. Right? Rotation is position. Torque is tension. I was like, all right, so this seems to be two, two torque chains, one that goes toward the center and one that goes that gets away from it. And that's what I ended up calling internal torque chain and external torque chain. It was not based on rotation. It was based on where is the tension going toward. It, does it go toward the body or away from it? Toward the center of the body or away from it? And so that to me seemed to be the, the first principle I would, I would look at when I looked at movement. Cool. Yeah, it's, I was interesting to kind of go back because I, I feel like this stuff has been in a lot of people's heads at, at least as it it's at least floating around there. Cause we always watch Well, knees go in on the squat. Why does that do that? Mm -hmm. And there's different school. Like, exactly. yeah. And so it's, everyone sees these things, but to actually have a system yes. that you can, and right. I feel like that you can easily resonate with too. Someone who's been on the show a bunch of times, super smart guy, uh, Dr. Pat Davidson had wrote an article called knees in yeah. for the win with squatting. And a lot of that, I had to read that article a few times because it was, it was based on the gate cycle and compression and expansion, which I totally all agree mm -hmm. with, but I'm always looking at, well, what are the, what is a, a really simple way too that we could like? How am I going to communicate that to a client potentially? If I do, if I choose to um, exactly. communicate something related to the movement, if it's especially a strength movement, I think it's a little bit harder to feel these things in the course of sprinting strength, or something yeah. ballistic. But if it's a strength movement, what are some things I can communicate? So I was going to say it was funny because I think it was Pat or somebody. It might it might have been Pat had talked about just by training the adductors, like it made a lot of things better. Like I've heard that in the compression yeah. expansion model. It makes On sense. On the inside like, hammy. Yeah. Yeah. Just even yeah. generally. And it's like, well, why does that make everything better? Well, if we're looking at maybe you're too there's too much external torque in the system, too much external rotation, just something that brings it into more internal, as simple as that balance. Could, could make a substantial balance. change. Yeah, balance. Balance. Okay. So okay, well, let's decompose the squat, for example. So because that's so I started with the pressing and, you know, external torque where I was like, I disagree, right? But let's look at the squat for a second. What is a squat in nature? 
Right. So I'm not talking about like squatting to take a poop or anything like that. We're talking about how to create tension. Right. The only form you're going to go is jumping. Right. After that, you're hinging. Pick up a stone. You're not squatting a stone. You're hinging a stone. Look at strong men. Their ass is in the air and they just, you know, they hinge their mm -hmm. way into bringing the stone to the lap and then they're going to squat it up. Right. But if you look, it's a jump form. It's the same thing as uh, putting a stone over a bar. You never break parallel to do that. It's actually, it's not actually interesting. You actually lose power doing that. Same thing for a jump. Very few people will get stronger trying to break parallel to jump. So the jump form to load, you go to a certain part. Below that, you'll notice you start to involve different ideas. So it seems to me that loading the squat on the way down does not involve the same tension as exploding from the down up. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have a loading form where if you look when you want to jump, your ass drags back and then you drive up. So it looks to me that it's internal torque on the way down, external torque on the way up. Right. After that breaking parallel, we can have a conversation about that. But let's say just at parallel, we internal torque on the way down, external torque on the way up. If you were to train your adductors and the inside head of the hammy, it would, it would give you a better internal torque on the way down, which means you can load the squat better on the way down in order to release the spring and lift more weight on the way up. Like, you cannot jump without loading. You cannot squat without loading. So the better you are at loading, the more you be will be able to express that external torque, that potential that you have towards strength, explosion, and all that thing. And so that's why, for example, working the adductors will help for squatting because you are able to load better, stabilize the weight better. You're able to go from a better position from which you're going to explode, which obviously matters. I wanted to take a quick break from the show to tell you a little bit about our sponsor, SimplyFaster.com. SimplyFaster.com is a fantastic coaching resource, not only on the level of their blog and all the information they put out, but also on the level of their online store. With the click of a button, you can see and purchase the technology that is utilized by so many of the world's great coaches. In SimplyFaster.com's online store, you can have access to training technology such as blood flow restriction training, timing systems, including the free lap timing system, bar speed tracking devices, a variety of resistance training machines, such as the K-Box, and also Kaiser training units, which Kaiser training units being strongly recommended by sprint coach Randy Huntington, for example. You'll also get access to motorized sprint training units such as the 1080 Sprint, force plates, and much more. You can check that all out by heading to simplyfaster.com. That's simply with an I, faster.com. Let's get back to the show. Yeah, it's interesting. Even just in the last two sessions, I mean, this is such an N of one anecdote, but with, with the sandbag, mm -hmm. I got, it's only like 100 pounds, but I, I just, I made kind of a game up for my winter workout where I like flip a card. And if it's a certain card, I have to you know clean it and throw it over my shoulder. Like if it. it's another one, I have to throw like it for it. distance or whatever. And there's one where I sprint up the hill. And I, I can't hold it around my chest and sprint up the hill. Anyways, two days after doing these workouts, like I did one on Saturday and one on Tuesday. And man, my squat, just in the short term, and, you know, novelty and all that too. But my squats felt mm -hmm. so good a couple of days after doing that. And I was just thinking like, and I'm a very externally rotated individual too. I was a high jumper. And for me, like it's right. a lot of yeah. to set up the jump and mm -hmm. before you're going to step, you're yeah. really externally rotating to like load the spring. And unfortunately, that carries into like all my sprinting and squatting in a way that doesn't allow me compression. And so I was just and right. it was funny about those sandbag, you know, just just like bending over to pick up a sandbag. I was feeling mm -hmm. my hamstrings a lot more than like a typical deadlift or whatever. And I was curious 100%. why that might be. So, I, yeah, if you, maybe some of the things that are come with that that can benefit some other movements. I'd be curious to go into more. Nuts right. And bolts but for, because the sandbag, for example, is you, you pick it up, you have to squeeze. They, it's a natural movement where you can't really you would have to work very hard. Like it's it's very interesting. We all do things the wrong way. We all do things the right way differently, but we all do things the wrong way the same. If you try to pick up a sandbag and it's heavy enough, you will see everybody starting, let's say, on Olympic weightlifting position. The second the sandbag goes, gets heavy, the hips go up and they're going to hinge their way. Their knees are not going to be out anymore. They're going to be in line. The knees are going to be in line with, with the ankles. The hips are going to be high and you're going to hinge and you're going to put the stress where it should be, which is the glutes and hammies. That is the base of your structure, for example, on the squat, but especially on the deadlift and things like this. On the deadlift, because of the way the leverage is set up with a barbell, I can actually move my body around 
and find different position. Mm. A sandbag, you don't have that choice. You yeah. have your feet on the side and you have to squeeze. By squeezing, you involve the pec, right? You involve the biceps, you involve that internal torque chain that I talk about all the time. And suddenly, everybody connects together and that tension carries its own position. Because you have it, the tension on the sandbag is very, very specific. It carries its own position. If you can just go with it without having a, a mindset or looking a certain way, you will find those internal torque muscles almost naturally. A barbell, the skill is much, much, much higher. So suddenly the teaching goes into it and mm -hmm. then suddenly you're trying to achieve a, I'm supposed to look like this or whatever. And honestly, your head gets in the way half the time. You should feel the same muscle on, on a deadlift. But because it's been taught a certain way with knees out, back straight, which now means very arch, yeah. it used to be neutral spine, neutral spine is complete bullshit now. It's just mm -hmm. over arch and everything because we're going back to the form police where people don't deadlift anymore. They do some type of excessively rot externally rotated hip position to go up, destroying themselves in the process. But like there's been an evolution on the form of the deadlift that is fascinating to watch. I don't know how many people told me that Eddie Hall and Haftor deadlift incorrectly. Those are the two men that deadlifted over 500 kilos and they deadlift incorrectly. I'm like, really? Really? You're deadlifting 500 kilos incorrectly? Like, that's interesting. <laughs> so you think they went from 300 kilos to 500 kilos incorrectly? They're just big. I'm like, oh, how, how interesting. You know what I mean? Like, so the sandbag you don't have that leeway no one taught you how to do a sandbag and there's really not a million videos out there and you have to grab it so you mm -hmm. lean forward and then as you grab it you can't really put your hips under it because the size of the bag doesn't let you do that so you're kind of stuck in the same form every time and get you can't really drive your knees out so much like it's not comfortable that tension is going to drive its own positioning which i find extremely valuable and it's a lot of hammies yeah. And so also what it shows you is that carrying a sandbag is all hammies and glutes. Yeah. It's a, yeah. With, it's the, not quite. with the anecdote of your wife and, and sprinting too, back to that. Yeah, I, exactly. I think there's something that's so cool. Uh, give me your thoughts uh, on this, Julian, is the idea of, oh, I, I just think it's interesting. Like in modern, I guess you could say strength and conditioning, or even I suppose teaching CrossFit. I'm not super into the cro uh, CrossFit world. Mm -hmm. I see some athletes training from time to time. But the thing with a barbell is, it does, like you mentioned, like the form police, like here's a barbell. There's so many ways you could do it. Just the fact that there's so yeah. many ways you can do it, it could be good, but you could be spending a lot of mental energy doing something that is taking away. And right. also just like the very organic core of the session, um, Marv Marinovich, who's really well known, passed away uh, recently, but trainer out of uh, Bay Area in California talked about, he used like little... um like a lot of like balancey stuff, not like crazy amounts of balance, but like a, mm -hmm. like a wooden, like a metal disc with a, a ball on the bottom. You stood on it and you'd, you'd squat like that. And he would say the advantage of using that is you're letting your body select. Basically, the, it's going to find the one way that you can squat on this because you're, you can't squat on it's a only balance. Only one. Yeah, yeah exactly. there's pretty yeah. much only one way. And they would, I think, make it more ballistic and find ways to make it explosive. But that always did stick with me is the idea of letting the body choose. And because it, it creates a different like feel to the training session, it's not like, oh, well, uh, my coach told me to do this with my knees, so I got to make sure I do this. And you did it and versus, right. hey, like... What if it's wrong, by the way? Yeah. What yeah, if it's wrong? Yeah. And a sandbag, like you, so, like you said, you can't. You just yeah, got to do it. Part of my... Assess so, I'll, I'll two stories just to um, on, on the point which to agree with you fully. So, let me start with this one. So, one of my assessments on the squat, my knee hurts, my back hurts when I squat or whatever. Let's say you have a shift in the hip, right? You shift mm -hmm. to the right when you squat. I'm going to make you squat with a barbell, and then we see the shift on the right. I'm going to make you squat with a sandbag. You're going to grab it, bear hug it, and squat it. I don't see the same shift in your right hip. You know what I mean? It means you don't have a squat problem. You have a barbell problem. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so that's a simple assessment. Do you have a barbell problem, or do you have a squat problem? You will be surprised a number of times where people had a barbell problem. So the thing was... It was their upper back because that's where the barbell rests. Yeah. If your upper back is not capable of taking the weight equally on both sides and you're always stronger on one side, let's say you played basketball or whatever, you're stronger on one side. Your upper back is stronger on one side, whatever. That means the other side is going to cave in a bit. That means the barbell is going to lean a bit on that side. No one is going to squat with a barbell mm -hmm. that is not even. So what you do, you shift your hip under to make the barbell straight. 
but you didn't do it to your upper back. You did it to your hips. So now when you come down, your hip is going to shift because you have to compensate for the barbell not being evenly distributed on your upper back. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. 100%. And so now everybody's going to try to fix the hip. But the problem is not the hip. Your problem is your upper back. You just can't take the weight on your back. So you have a structure problem. No, you have a barbell problem. You don't have a squat problem. Now you have a squat problem, but that's not where the problem starts. Right? So many times you see that happening. So that brings the second point of the, of the assessment is now that's something that I've learned to do over years of assessing people is asking them, are you doing what you think you should be doing? And it's a very important point because many, many times I was going into a squat trying to fix a squat and then I give the proper form to the for that person, right? We find it through the sandbag, different assessment. And I'm like, all right, this he you were squatting this way, let's try it this way. This way doesn't hurt your knee, doesn't hurt your back. All right, we're winning. I come back four weeks later and they're basically trying to do the first form again. And I'm like, why? And <laughs> over time, what I realized is that they were they were doing maybe consciously, but they were doing what they thought. They should be doing. Maybe their first coach taught them a certain way. Maybe they saw too many videos a certain way. But they ended up doing what they thought they should be doing, not what felt better, but instead mm -hmm. what they thought they should be doing. So now during my assessment, I've learned to ask, are you doing what you think you should be doing? Because a lot of times they go, yeah. I'm like, oh, shit. All right. So now I have to, I have to unfuck you, basically. Because you have, and maybe the coach had the best intention in the world and everything, mm -hmm. but that particular form, at least the way you understood it, the way you're doing it, is incorrect for you. But I can't change it until you realize that that's not the way to do it for you. So then that becomes the problem. So when you go with a barbell, which is a million ways to defend, man, I hope the coach is right. Because what if he's wrong for you, right? So, and unfortunately, not every coach is as versed into the back squat, maybe as they should be, right? And then I'll talk about, because I've seen that many times in CrossFit. By the way, I've seen it in global gyms even worse. And I've seen with uh, sprint trainers, I got to tell you, they might be great at sprinting, but Jesus Christ, they suck in the weight room. And so, and the, the, worst, the worst culprits were the physios that were teaching a squat with the knees out past mm -hmm. the ankle. So all the pressure being on the knee never lined up with the ankle. Why to this day, I don't understand where they switch completely toward the outside of the foot, where we both know that the sprinting is that, you know, yeah, you the, the inside the, of yeah, the foot. moves towards the inside edge as you hit the ground. Yeah, You move toward the inside. By the way, that's internal torque, right? When yeah. you Because it's a hinge, you go toward the internal torque. There is no such thing as external rotation in the sprint or going toward the outside of the foot, if you do it correctly, obviously. So that's kind of the squat they're teaching. So many times what I saw with sprinters is the way they were lifting was not in par with the way they were running, then why are we doing that? Because then you're going to create injuries. You're actually learning to develop strength a certain way, but a strength you're going to use differently on the track. That's not going to go well. Sorry, my cat has to go into <laughs> There you go. There's, there's awesome. a main room for you right there. Yeah. So, so you could see how you could actually, over the long run, hurt sprinters by teaching the squatting correctly. So that knees out outside of the foot type of thing for sprinters is a humongous mistake that is not talked about. You know how I fix it? I give you a sandbag because then the conversation is gone. Half because the tension is obvious with a sandbag and the other half because you haven't seen a million videos of and you don't have 10 coaches teaching you to squat in a way that is that might not be the best for you. I don't know. I don't know you or the person but that might not be the proper way to, to do the squat because, again, it's not about position. It's about tension. I don't care about the knees up. You shouldn't either. And they go like, well, you don't want knees in. I'm like, is there something in between? How about knees over the ankles? And by the way, we don't want knees in. How far? How far is too much? Where is the line? Because knees out, then there's also two knees out. They can go too far, I'm guessing. Where's that line? Because you say knees out. What does that mean? Because knees out forever. Yeah. So what? I'm going to keep pushing my knees out a bit more every time. Where am I five years from now? That's the problem with position, man. It just doesn't work. It's tension, not position. When you sprint, I don't care how good you look. Right? It's like, how fast did you run? Are you getting better or worse? That's it. Which is why I love performance. Yeah. Because it's a check. Yeah. 
And sprinting is so good too, because when it comes down to it and you have to run as fast as you can, a lot of times the the positions the coach told you go out the window <laughs> and the body finds yeah. the internal torques, power levers that actually exactly. all the time. Exactly. So my job as a coach is just to give you that tension, to make you better within the tension that you can use. That's my job. That's it. It's not to make you look good. It's not to, like, you do that. You make yourself feel good. All I can do is give you the muscle capacity to use that tension toward a better form that you will find, not me. So all I could do for me was to decompose movement into first principles and go, okay, I need internal torque for the sprint. Which muscle is that? So it's inside hammy, glute max. You know, you start to see the same Mm-hmm. Usual suspect popping up, and you're like, all right, so how do I work that? Well, Nizar doesn't do it, that's for sure. I'm like, all right, so let me try to find a form of hinge that works better. All right, so we start to hinge. All right, but with a barbell, they do need, all right, so let me grab a sandbag. And then every time I ended up with sandbag because it was a simpler tool to use, if that makes sense, right? I have no ego when it comes mm-hmm. to that, right? I'm like, look, whatever gets you the proper tension, if we, we're staying with that. To this day, the best thing I can do for my wife is heavy sandbag carries. Because that, that's what we do once a week. So, like, uh, we did a lot of work. She went back to, sp- well, she was in Holland uh, two weeks ago. She went back to sprinting and she beat a girl that had a um, 60 meter. She has a 7, 8, 60 meter and she beat her fairly handily. So, even though she hasn't sprinted in a year, but we built the hammies correctly because the injury was so bad. We rebuilt correctly. I bet you she would run a 7 4 right now. Without training, which is pretty good. Yeah, it is. It is interesting to think about. I mean, that was one of my big moments. Was when I was um, when I was in college. I was a you know, triple jumper, high jumper, sprints a little bit. But it was funny how no one taught me how to squat. Like I, I remember when I was like fourteen, mm-hmm. I pulled like the the old Kmart concrete weights up to my room, and I was yeah. like twelve. And I did that too. And I did. And it's funny because the one lift that didn't actually feel good to me was like putting the bar on my back and trying to squat it because I didn't I just just didn't make sense like and I right. no one was teaching yeah, me how exactly. to do it and I was mm-hmm. like ah this just doesn't feel good so I just stuck with wall sits and you know the, did the little leg curl and leg extension because that was easy and then eventually I figured out squatting in high school and college but I remember when I was a junior in college it was my best track season I I was squatting more I felt like my legs just aren't very strong and I just did what felt good like literally what felt good I wasn't I didn't read any books I didn't <laughs> and what felt good was to have a kind of narrow stance and kind of push my knees forward and do a lot of pressure on the balls of my feet and that's just what felt good and I think so that, like a sprinter yeah. yeah and and but what's funny is I uh later when in my mid 20s I was reading the official books by the certifying bodies and it's like okay, okay you got to have your knees out at 45 degrees you got to have your heels you know push through my heels which is like the I can't I don't do that yeah no do not do <laughs> no, that. no 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 yeah, it's funny that's a huge mistake yeah and, yeah and in the process of all that I remember my high jump approach I'd go to meets and I was stronger than ever in all my lifts and all that stuff. And then, but I'd go to meets and my uh, high jump approach was five feet shorter. Like my stride length had decreased pretty substantially. And I think one, just a loss of general elast- elasticity from overemphasizing the weight room was, was one aspect. But then two, I, I think about what you mm-hmm. talk about internal torques. And I, I think, yes. I actually think more, I, you know, I think the stance foot is interesting because it's kind of like externally rotating, but then the foot hits and friction causes it going to the inside edge. And, mm-hmm. and there's probably different ways to go with that. And, and I, you'd be curious to sit down and go over a video with you. But I, I know for a fact, I love, absolutely love the idea of the kick. Like, because you have to, to throw a kick, you have to enter or a punch, you have to internally right. rotate. Like no one goes to the bar and hits Always. that punching yeah. machine and externally rotates. And I think about the yeah. leg, the swing leg coming through in a sprint has to internally rotate, not as much as a kick, obviously, but it has to a little bit. If someone stays like you, if you run like a cowboy, you just, you know, wobble side to side and right. you can't you wanna, get any stride. You never run fast. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so I was, but, thinking, yeah, yeah, my stride like anyways had decreased a lot. And I, I blame knees out squats to the heels on at least a portion of that. Right. So. so let's talk about that a little bit with elasticity. Look at it this way. So what is mobility? Mobility is range of motion under tension. Right? So there's a difference between flexibility and mobility. Flexibility is range of motion, but now we're talking about range of motion under tension. In a sprint, as you're running, we don't care about flexibility. We only care about mobility because you need the tension to, as you extend the leg fully, that's under tension. And then you touch the ground, that's under tension. You bring it back, that's under tension. So all interest us on this one is mobility. 
mobility. So we're going to have a mobility in the external torque chain, but also in the internal torque chain. So if you start to knees out, externally rotate and everything, and you're only developing the strength in the external torque chain and not in the internal torque chain, the first thing you're going to lose is mobility in the internal torque chain. Because as you get, you don't train the internal torque chain, it gets weaker. You lose that range of motion under tension. You don't lose the range of motion, but you lose the tension part. So it doesn't matter. There's two ways to lose mobility. You can lose range of tension, or you can lose range of motion, or you can lose tension. As you get weaker in the internal torque chain because you're not training it anymore, you start to lose the tension part, which will shorten your stride. Because if you were to lengthen the stride and do the same as before, you would put your body at risk because it doesn't have the muscle capacity to handle that particular range of motion. So naturally, it will shorten itself. So the best way to increase mobility for that would be to increase the strength of the internal torque chain and then start to play with the range of motion. So that's why I did the same thing for Janina. We started working on that as well. So at first it was, let's rebuild the hammy, but then we work on the internal torque chain throughout the range of motion. And that's what carried over on the track. But the whole, all she was doing before that were power clean. Power clean mm. is all external torque. Yeah. That was doing zero for sprinting because he was not developing the internal torque chain. Yeah, it's, it is. So you yeah. know what the power clean did? He made her better out of the blocks. Yes. So yeah. my wife is one of the best out of the blocks. So when she was 17, she power cleaned 80 kilos. Just so you know, she's a fucking like, she's that strong naturally. So the best out of the blocks. Yeah, but guess what? Sprinting is not just out of the blocks. You're going to have to actually run too. And that part is not external torque. And that's why she was getting in trouble. Yeah. It's that's so interesting. I, a story I tell, I used to tell my athletes, the athletes I worked with this all the time, especially like swimmers who they had been doing some lifting earlier on, or they, they had seen a lot of early success, improving their squad, improving their clean, but they yes, always kind true, of, always. And, and you will, but there always comes that point where you're trying to take the clean so mm -hmm. far. Oh, mm -hmm. if I just get five more kilos, oh, I'm going to be, and there comes that point right. where now the muscle balance, like you said, there's a different muscle balance and it is bilateral too. It's not even, it's not reciprocal and alternating for one thing and anything you take it's bilateral. And yep. so I, I remember, but anyways, I, I tell people this story is when I was um, a freshman in college, I would read all these stories of like these Olympic lifters who could run these amazing like 20 and 40 yard dashes. And there was some story of a Russian athlete who I think he clean and jerked I don't know this in kilos, but about 500 pounds at 198 pounds body weight. So a, a ridiculous. I'm trying yeah, to think that's Olympic I, level. I, yeah, it, it was. Yeah, it was, it was a world yeah. record or close to it. And the, and the, the yeah. it might have been Vardanian or something like that. But apparently, this guy could high jump. <laughs> that sounds right. Yeah, seven yeah. or two meters, fifteen or seven feet off three steps. And I was like, I was like, oh, that's insane. And of course, it's chicken or the egg too, because anyone who's powerful enough to do that. And give them a certain body type is going to be able to do powerful sprint stuff too. And you're feeding, you know, their nervous system with the stimulus yeah. and all that. And yes. so I had it in my head for two years that, oh, I got to get my clean to this. And what's funny too, is I actually was not squatting a lot. And I mean, I was, but n not the way I described my junior, where it's like narrow stance, using mm -hmm. more internal torque and all these things. And I remember I got my clean to a personal best by, I mean, it was like, it wasn't a lot. It was like 110 kilos, at, at, you know, for a high jumper. That was okay. Still good. Still but, good. Yeah. But my, still a good clean. but it was, but I, my high jump sucked that year. And the worst thing was that it wasn't, my high jump was bad, but my sprinting was horrible. And I wasn't doing a lot of sprinting either, but I remember getting beat by this pole vaulter who like didn't, I remember he'd eat nachos for lunch yeah. every day and wasn't a very, and this guy was, I'm barely beating this guy. I'm like, oh my God, like, what am I, yeah. what is going on here? And it, yeah. I mean, it, it was totally multifactorial, but the, the, anyways, the next year improved my squat a ton, as I was saying, kind of more of a straight, narrow stance. And, you know, at some point yeah. too, there's a speed specificity, but I was doing a lot more sprinting with the group. That was a huge thing too. Some longer sprints that with rhythm, that was important. But anyways, the next year just blew away all my PRs. I was way faster. I mean, by a magnitude. And I, I just think about, right. and, but I, my clean sucked that next year though. It's funny because I, we were doing, the, mm -hmm. I did the workout my coach wrote and it was like sets of 10 on cleans. I'm like, I don't know, I guess I'll just do it, you know, and it, but I never lifted a lot. Yeah. And I don't know, it's just kind of funny that my clean that next year was like 90 kilos when I tested it and barely like that pattern was so bad, but my squat had gotten better and I was just sprinting more and Anyway, sorry, exactly. long-winded no, story. Obviously long it's, it's multifactorial, yeah. but let's say you increase in the weight room, by the way, it should lead to performance. Otherwise, why are we doing it? Yeah. Anyway, right? But anyway, 
you get stronger by, let's say, 20 kilo on a clean or whatever, you should be able to see that results applying to whatever, whatever you're doing because you got stronger normally. That means neural output is higher, muscle capacity is higher, you can create better tension. So we should see that result. But it would show you that the clean did not, it might help jumping off of three steps, but it will not help your sprinting because it's not the same torque chain. So that was that was really the base of my work. It's like, all right, so we need to know when to use the clean and when to use the squat with knees forward with the weight on the ball of the foot. Because, for example, also it means that you have a specific body type that requires that type of squatting. As a coach, I need to know that, and I need to know that for the next athletes who might have the same body type you do, and then I cannot make the mistake of making him squat through the uh, the heels, which you should never do anyway. Say goodbye to your lower back on that one. But you know what I mean, like there's stuff like that. We need to stop looking at movement like there is the squat and then there is the deadlift. It's, there's none of that. There's only tension. Which tension are we creating? That's the only thing we should. And then the implement we're using, eh, who cares? By the way, I can make your squat to go from 100 kilo to 120 kilos. Does that mean you got stronger? All right. What does stronger mean? Because if I make you clean a lot and you improve your technique, you're going to clean more. Just on technique alone. Does that mean you get stronger? What if I improve your muscle capacity? All right, that might be stronger. What if I improve your neural output? What if if I put a gun to your head and I say, if if you don't lift that weight, I shoot you? Trust me, you lift more weight. Does that make you stronger? It's like that lady who lifted the car off the kid. Because her kid, you know, was trapped under, in, I think it was England. She lifts the car to, to save her kid. She blew up her bicep and broke two vertebras in wow. her neck. So, but just to show you, that's what neural output has a limit because usually your, your body cannot follow past it. But that means that just improving neural output can allow you to lift more weight. Does that mean you got stronger? Well, technically, yes, but not in a way that you can use in your sport anyway. So that's why, like that whole conversation about getting stronger is tricky. What we need is to have first principles so that we know what is it we're shooting for. And for me, the most important part was internal torque versus external torque. So I know which system to use. Both need to be balanced always. But I need to know which system I'm going after to benefit you in your activity, whatever that is. Yeah. So with that, like with the balance. So I, I, one thing I'll say too, mm-hmm. when you were talking about Olympic lifts, are you talking about more like a power catch? Because I was thinking in a full catch clean, you like my I those always worked better for me because my knees always would naturally kind of drop inwards on that catch a little bit, and yeah. I felt more it's adductor, yeah. and I would always just feel more athletic exactly. doing full catch cleans than actually doing like a high catch clean. And maybe so that was a big a reason why. full catch clean. You're gonna have to catch an internal torque at the bottom because your hips are below your knees. The second your hips are below your knees, you get an internal torque. Because you are not in a position to create power once your hips are below your knees. If you see what happens every time, look at a Olympic weightlifter lifting very heavy knees. You're going to see the hips come in, but then the hips are going to come out, right? So the knees are going to come in, actually, come in and back, right? Every time until their hips are above their knees, and then the hips are going to push forward and the knees are going to come out. So it's internal torque into external torque. You will see that on heavy clean. So when you do a full clean, you can coach catch an internal torque, which is a more interesting movement for you, probably because you're a jumper and a sprinter and everything, which is what you naturally should favor. A power clean is a full external torque thing. So my wife was great at power cleans because she has those. That's what she's good at. She's great at squatting. She has a massive glute mid. She's great off the blocks. Her work needs to be done on the internal torque chain because that's where she's going to lose more, right? So for example, in her case, she doesn't need the power clean. She's already, she can power clean 100 kilos right now. Who cares? Mm-hmm. Like, who cares? At some point, by the way, like the difference between 80 kilo, 90 kilo, 100 kilo of the block is not that big. After it's more technique of the block, once you have that power, you're fine, right? So after that, we, it's mo- far more interesting for us to work on internal torque and the sandbag than it is to work on a full power clean or stuff like that. So the balance depends a bit on the goals, depends a bit on the sport yeah. you're choosing and your body type as well. Like if you're a more like a internal torque person, I'm going to make sure that you have enough external torque to do what we want. That might not be your strong suit, so we don't need to be world champion at that either, but I'm probably going to have to put some in there to make sure that some is done. And then we'll focus on what is more required 
for your sport. In the case of my wife, I don't have to do external torque at all because she's so good at it. So once in a while, just so she can have fun. But the work has to be on the internal torque. So it's always a balance between the two, but most of the time, the structure is in the internal torque. So no matter what, a lot of time has to be spent on the internal torque because if you don't have a structure, that means you cannot load. If you cannot load, you cannot express your strength and you will get hurt more often. So that's where the balance for me, the, the base of the pyramid is always internal torque because without it, you are not capable of loading and you are more likely to get hurt. So the structure is in internal torque. So that's why I think it matters so much with the sandbags because it builds your structure. Yeah, I remember I don't it's I'll have to put this in the show notes, but I saw a visual somebody made with like the different muscles in those torque chains mm -hmm. and in the it's like yellow and red. And yeah. at, yeah. in the the internal, it's like you have glutes, you got adductors, you got I think it was like the obliques, like it, it was like a lot yeah, of the power, obliques. the power muscles, the muscles you associate with being fast and explosive and powerful. So it does strike me that, yeah, if we're looking at building an app, especially like an athlete hit, has to do cyclic movements like running, <laughs> anything is going to want yeah. to have a base of that. So that is that for the, I mean, I'm curious, is there athletes who, I guess like a rower or something like are there athletes that what, what athletes would be more external torque chain dominant than? Oh, like external torque yeah. chain dominant, you would have, for example, the, um, like a high jumper. Yeah. I thought, so no, no high jumper because you have to run. But I mean, like someone who uh, jumps on a high box, sorry. Like, you know, but feet on the ground without running, just from oh, just, a desk. Just like a standing box jump type thing. Right, a standing yeah. box jump, right? That's ex fully external torque. A power clean is fully external torque. A jerk, like, like to get the weight mm. of your chest is going to be full external torque. Then you have to catch in internal torque. But there are some activities like that where you're going to be external torque. Honestly, it's probably 80, 20, 80% 80 internal torque, 20% mm. external torque if you look at overall, overall activities. Like, for example, sprinting. Because it's about speed, people think strength. But the 100-meter dash, which mm. is the one where everybody thinks explosive, is what, 40 strides, 45 strides on average? That's not explosive strength. Now, you go as fast as you can, but 40 strides does not qualify as an explosive energy system off the blocks yet, but not the running itself. So people also have to understand the difference between external torques are explosive and speed off of running 100 meters. Those are not the same things, right? So pure external torque would be the power clean is a better is, is the better uh, thing. Like you know, if you bench off the chest, that's going to be external torque, and then the locking out is actually going to be in internal torque. So. The external torque movements are very, very, very specific. Even a rower is in internal torque mostly. Because oh, really? okay. you know why? Because external torque, well, because external torque, how many times can you box jump to a max height in a row? Three? You know, like it doesn't last very long. That's the problem with external torque because it's made for pure explosiveness. It doesn't last long. That's that's the trade-off. By the way, you need a massive amount of neural output in external torque. Right. How many of that of those do you get? Right. So look at an Olympic weightlifter making the faces. Yeah. They always like you know Klokov uh, mm -hmm. being like he's growling oh, yeah. and he's like this max reps and he's going like this. Look at a sprinter how relaxed his face is. Mm -hmm. You can tell from a nervous system perspective it's not the same effort. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's an interesting one too. With like I, I you were talking with uh, Mike Tushur on a podcast I was listening to. Mm -hmm. This is fascinating. And yep. you were talking about within it's like within these internal and external internal torques, there's also the different branches of the autonomic nervous system that get activated, yeah. the sympathetic and even personality, which I found fascinating. So, because sprinting, yes. I always, I find everyone loves sprinting. And I think for, you, you always wonder, it's just running as fast as you can. Like what's up? But there's like all these things found in that of our humanity that I think are so interesting. And yes. one is that like, you know, relaxation and there is shades of how relaxed some people are, but it is like, like you had talked about, Still. there's it's not with the the, impa, the the sympathetic and parasympathetic, like the fight or flight and the rest are relaxed. It's not like they're totally in on a seesaw. They actually can both kind of be up. Like, can you go into that? Because I'm curious how that fits with right. sprinting. It's really interesting. Right. So, uh, so real quick, like to explain, we have the parasympathetic, what people call rest and digest, but that's not true. What you have with the parasympathetic is you have the flow and you have the freeze. Freeze mode is playing dead. Right, it's a very, very old defense mechanism that we have. That's actually the first one that we get from bugs. Right, playing dead is the first uh, defense system we all have. That's called 
And that's going to be the dorsal vagus nerve, which is the vagus nerve is the super highway of information in the body that is not on the sympathetic side, but on the parasympathetic side. And the oldest form we have is the body telling the mind to shut everything off. It's a plain dead. As evolution has progressed, we are creating more and more of a ventral control, which means the top-down control of the vagus nerve is still 80-20, 80% dorsal, 20% ventral. The reason for that is that we live in society now. We are not bugs anymore. We need to be able to communicate emotions, to communicate friendship versus enemy type of thing, to live in society, right? So how do I do that? Well, first thing first, I control the muscle of the face because if I start to make that face next to someone, I look dangerous, that's not <laughs> going to work. So yeah. the more I can relax those muscles below the eyes, the more I show calmness, <clears throat> not being dangerous, right? So control of the muscle of the face is actually one of the signal of the ventral vagus nerve, the parasympathetic side. And that's going to come to a very important point because we're going to see the sprinters have to relax Relax their face. It's actually taught in sprinting. Relax your face. Well, it's the exact opposite of what you see an Olympic weightlifter when he lifts. What's interesting is before he lifts, he has to be very calm. That's why you see the, the face is completely passive. Well, not passive, but relaxed. Sorry. And then when he lifts, and you see, you start to see that. And then, like, you see all the face because he goes full sympathetic to go external tour. So if you start to look closely, you will start to see very specific signals associated with external torque, very specific associated with internal torque. And those signals explain sympathetic on mm. one side, parasympathetic on the other. So the sympathetic is a fight or flight. This is the one where you just go berserk and answer right away. So people have a tendency to think you're either in parasympathetic or sympathetic, but that's not true. It happens that they work together. The best way I can explain is the fundamental part of human being, sex drive, for example. So for example, you're on the first date, you start to sweat from your forehead, your heart rate is elevated, your pupil, you're in a sympathetic reaction. All those are sympathetic reaction. And yet, you don't go and when she opens the door, you don't clock her on the chin saying, hi, my name is, I mean, hopefully you don't do that, right? So, but at dinner, you're trying to remain very cool. You're trying to be interesting, but inside you're dying. So that's your parasympathetic and your sympathetic trying to work together in order to achieve the greatest amount of intensity where you are at your most attentive, where you can give the most attention to the situation. So it turns out the parasympathetic and sympathetic work together. Look at a boxer. A boxer in the middle of the fight when he's winning, right? He's actually super chill, but... You see him going like this and stopping. Mm. The reason he's stopping is because he doesn't want to fall into a trap. That's a freeze mode. Because if you were to go full sympathetic, you would try swinging every time you can. But then you fall into a trap, you get knocked out. So you see a good fighter who comes in and he's all relaxed. He's going to go, oh, no, not now. That little hinge right there, that's a freeze mode. It's his brain going, no, 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 not yet, not yet. I don't know about that one. But then he has to be able to, whenever you see an opening, hit as fast as he can. That's the sympathetic. But you'll notice it hits always in internal torque. So that's more toward the flow side. So the better fight is when you're in flow, when the parasympathetic and sympathetic work together to create a very high intensity under control. If you go too intense, you lose control. That's when a guy gets punched. Then he gets angry and he starts swinging. That's not good either. But if he doesn't punch enough, he's going to get killed. So you don't want to be in a, in a freeze mode either. So the better space is when those two work together. And that's what you see the greatest athletes do, is that capacity to remain calm under control, even though the world is a chaos. That's Usain Bolt when he runs like super relaxed, like he doesn't have a care in the world. Bullshit. Trust me, he's in front of 60,000 people in the stadium. It's the gold medal of the Olympics. The world is watching. He has learned to use that to perform at his best. But that doesn't come naturally. He has to learn to get the parasympathetic and sympathetic together. If you go sympathetic, full sympathetic, what do you see? You see that when people start swinging, they open up like crazy because you go toward that tension away from the body. So they swing weirdly. When someone is very calm, they can stay inside and stay within that internal tone. So your state of mind will influence your movement and vice versa. And so it's not about parasympathetic or sympathetic. It's the two working together because you want to be excited, but not to the moment where you lose control. Yeah, just from the general perspective of stay centered. 
like you could say it's the closer you are to center exactly. internal torque. And, you know, it's exactly. funny. So you're telling me that people who are really good at sprinting also will probably do pretty good on the first date. Is what you're saying? <laughs> but do you know what's funny? They're also very emotional people usually. I mean, maybe it's just yeah. my wife, but she's an extremely <laughs> emotional person. But when it comes to sprinting, she uses that. So it, when, when she does well, when she does poorly, then she'll stumble and everything. But if she can use that toward it, because extreme emotional means greater uh, neural output. And great neural output while staying calm is the best way of defining uh, sprinting because you have to try to move as fast as you can under control while staying relaxed. That's a very specific type of human being that can do that. Yeah, I do think there is something to like the the emotional intensity of a sprinter. What well, uh-huh. like there is there yeah. there is always the joke I that mean, the sprinters so- are very different than distance runners just from a pure disposition standpoint. They're not going to be quite the same uh, unless they've been maybe taught to be a certain way. But I feel like there's a certain intensity that uh, some of these athletes carry. I believe it's part of it because you, like, I mean, you've been on the track enough. Like the 400 meter athletes are just not the 100 meter sprinters. They just, you know, like personality wise and everything, yeah. they just, they, they don't, they don't, they're just not the same. I mean, I find the sprinters to be very specific people. Yeah, the short one, and the honestly, the like my wife is better at sixty meters than a hundred. You know what I mean? I think honestly, the more emotional they are, the shorter the distance. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Let's uh, let's have a yeah. Let's let's tell some uh, anyone who's listening who needs a master's thesis idea. You know, try it. Let's yeah, exactly. <laughs> there's sports psychology. Yeah, look at the emotional preponderance in sixty meter champions. Now, I mean, you're gonna see. Ask ask the spouse; they'll tell you everything you need to know. That's a study we should be doing. I mean, yeah, she's laughing. She's right there. She's laughing. Yeah, I remember somebody. I remember reading this. This is like 15 years ago. Some forum. Some guys like I'm a high jumper and I want to like date another high jumper. And someone else on the thread was like, No, marry a distance runner. They're super stable and consistent or something. Their personalities are like. <laughs> but from what I understand, all the high jumpers always do well in school. Did you notice that? I haven't like read all the ones I talked to. We're actually doing really well in school and stuff like that. Like we need to, this is what we need to study. We need to see personalities versus the track and field propensity, body type and stuff like that. I would, I I would find that fascinating. Yeah. You have me, you got me thinking now about that. Cause all the high jumpers I'm, I'm thinking uh, I've I've worked with a few who weren't, <laughs> but I've worked with some who really were good too. I, I you know I'm trying to think of all the people I, but the one who wasn't that I'm thinking of was very intelligent. He just didn't apply himself. Any, anyways, it's uh, right. Yeah, yeah. I, I it is so interesting. Like some of those you know archetypes or stereotypes. Are, there is always some truth. Like it, it is. It's it's fun to, so, to look at. Those. Obviously, yeah. Nothing is that simple. But I just find it fascinating to look at body type and personalities. Like for example, I've seen that with bodybuilders where there are certain body types. Like you look at an Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? Was very much like an internal torque muscle type of mm-hmm. guy. If you look at that map, like the yellow and the red. Look at an Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's basically everything in the internal torque chain, right? But if you look at a Dorian Yates, you're going to see everything in the external mm. torque chain. And you see two different types of training. Mm. Dorian Yates was one set, super intense, as hard as you can. Oh, yeah, intensity yeah. to the max, completely insane person. Schwarzenegger is more like high volume, get a pump, like super uh, extrovert type of people. He, like they were that dramatically opposite people, but also opposite physics that seems to fit external torque and internal torque. So again, there is no rule for that, but there seems to be propensities that I would love to see. What I saw is that for sure internal torque is more linked toward that flow state, whereas Mm -hmm. the external torque is more toward that fight state. For example, if you're going to do a max box jump, there is no way you're going at it chill, ever. Like, if you want to really generate, you're going to have to, you see people, they're about to jump and then they break. That's the freeze mode because yeah. they have not brought the neural output high enough to attempt the jump. So they get, and then they go back and then they turn around and then they turn around and they go, <laughs> and then they get super angry and super hyped up and then they can jump. It's very rare that people that can jump completely relaxed, the Chinese weightlifters do it, but everybody else needs to be like super pumped in order to be able to do that. Yeah, I, it makes me think too about uh, like like Dan John and Easy Strength. The idea of not needing to get yeah. emotionally aroused before walking under a bar because like cleans, is, especially. And I, I wonder if this kind of hurt me when I was trying to go too crazy. Is you know like a heavy clean, you can't right. just walk up. You lose to coordination. It. You kind of have yeah. to sit there and psych yourself up and find that mental moment. And at my experience, is so little but, of sandbags. Don't go too far. But yeah. one, one of the but you don't go too far. 
Yeah. If well, you go too far excited on the before a snatch, for example, if you if you lose your cool, you're not you're not catching it. You you're gonna have great extension, but you're not gonna catch the bar because you can't go back to that place of center calmness internal yeah. torque anymore because you went way too far on the sympathetic side. Yeah, it's all about that center. And I think people, that's a, what yes. I love about all the psychology and the mental element you bring, because I think it, we're so wired. I mean, we started this whole thing with position. Like we're so, it's so yes. common to just be like, oh, I'm going to teach you how to exercise. Here's position. Here's a position to hit or something. And it's like, it's the mind and the body. We'll it. It's it's yeah. everything. Being centered right. is everything. And the, the best athletes I've worked with in the gym who either are the most skilled, uh, a guy who was the... He's the American record holder in the 200 breaststroke. Um, he was a guy who was who never ever. I mean, and you don't even have to be that strong to be a 200 meter breaststroker, but and he never lost his calm state, no matter what the weight was. And the he wasn't a guy. Yeah. He wasn't a guy who went as heavy as others because I think internally he almost there was like something that he never he wanted to yeah. to go above. Yeah. I will never go above this because I will sacrifice mm -hmm. this state. I had a really good tennis player who was like that too. I noticed a lot of tennis I players. was a swimmer at some yeah. point. Yeah, I was a swimmer at some point. And the first thing you you learn is relaxation because otherwise you sink. Yeah. If you want to stay on top of the water, the good swimmer is the one I'm talking about. We say la glisse in French, where you just feel like you're on top of the water, not under. And that comes from a, a body positioning relaxed where you position yourself on top of the water and everything. It's a feeling, right? If you fight the water, you sink. It's over. Like you have to stay above it. And and so I bet you there would be something like that. To me, the mind and the body is the same. Like we divide it. We should not even do that. To me, it's the same thing. So that's why like there is no such thing as movement. It's the person squatting. Like so I never mm. teach a squat to a person. I teach that person to squat. Mm. I love that. that so that's why tension over your position. Yep. That goes back to the barbell too. Uh, you're just just mentioning like yeah. the person. He's got the bar. She's got the bar, and then they're gonna to to squat the bar. They have to twist their hips downstream. Versus, I just I I just think it's and all the things coaches will tell them to do. Oh, you gotta. It's kind of funny the sometimes million, yeah. to think about an industry that is uh, very largely based off of not the inverse of what you said. You, they are not. Yes. teaching the exercise to the person it is an industry that is based off in an educational system that is based off of very much at least here's the exercises here's how you coach athletes to these exercises and it, and we're yeah. going to feed them into that which is where i get pissed because that's what you see on instagram and youtube and everything is there's a way to squat when you suck at this right instead of changing that form that might not be yours i'm going to break you into doing that I'm going to make you do mobility. I'm going to teach you to push your knees forward or not. I'm going to, let's say you have super long femur, right? The knees out, narrow stance, fit forward is a nightmare because your hips mm -hmm. are over there. Yeah. That's not going to be, but so instead what they're going to do is they're going to put a kettlebell on your knees and work your ankle mobility, whatever the hell that is, because I still don't understand what the hell is ankle mobility. But you know, they're going to try to break you into that one form they want you to have. Why? That is not the way you're going to squat, dude. I had that so many times. People like came to me with wrecked hips. And the first thing I, I did was to stop the knees out, dude. <laughs> widen your stance. Put your knees on top of your ankles. So widen your stance until your ankles are below your knees. And within two, two weeks, the hips were hurting less. I'm like, yes, I'm not a magician either. You just, you know what I mean? They just break you into feeling that one pattern that they have. Even though I still don't know why squatting with the knees out is better, I don't think they can explain it to me either. It's well as the way it is. I'm like, says who? Moses coming from the mountain? <laughs> can, is that the 11th commandment? Thou shalt squat with your knees out? <laughs> is that the 11th commandment? Like, says who? Like, physios. I'm like, yeah. And I don't see any of them at the world level. Yeah. It, Go it, squat. It, then you tell me. It is interesting to think about where all this came from. And I, well, I'll say to this too, what do you think about, like, I'll see like a, I, I've seen like, um, like a Chinese Olympic lifter warming up, they're doing like squats and, and they are trying to keep their knees out until the weight gets to a certain point, And then of course they're going to tick in. They have to, they can't not. Right. So I, I, two things on that. Yeah. Their femur, their femur to tibular ratio oh, is yeah, yeah. very different sure. than yeah, Caucasians. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They are super short femur, so they can do whatever they want. Like for example, Tom Platt's, Right, mm -hmm. had a specific ratio. Remember the bodybuilder Tom Platt? Oh, yeah. people yeah, know him. Yeah, he was, eagle. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he was the goal. He was the, uh, you know, the golden shell of squatting. Anyway, he would do the hack squat where he could come down and 
get his hips away from the from the high squat pad until his knees were past his toes, almost on the other side of the like an insane amount. And he said, "I don't feel my knees; it's all on my calves." <laughs> I'm like, "Good for you! I can't do that, right?" So maybe that squat worked for uh, Tom Platts, but there's probably three people in the world that can do it. It's a ratio of the legs. So the Chinese weightlifters have very specific ratios that allow them to do certain things. Good for them. That might not be you. If it's you, by all means, have fun. I can't do that. So I had to learn something else. The second part is in, in uh, the Chinese weightlifting well uh, well system. They actually teach that when they reach the bottom to drive the knees in to activate the adductors to get mm. out of the squat, out of the bottom of the squat. So sounds like external internal torque to me. So they shoot down. And because of their narrow stance that they need for the clean, the knees come up naturally. But then the first thing they do on the tension is go back toward the internal torque. So this is still fit. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense too. And again, it just, it also makes sense with not trying to be a reductionist. Hey, here, I saw this population with this specific anthropometric squatting like be this versus careful like, with that. Right. like a, someone from like Scotland who's got like deep hip sockets right. and, you know, like just all sorts. Exactly. Of- or, you know, super, like for example, knees forward, uh, feet forward. That's the best example. Well, that depends on the position of your hip socket. Because we saw that in the Asian population, they are very straight hips, like, and very much uh, pointing forward. Does that make sense, right? So that means that they can squat straight up and down like that. But if you look at the Golic population, for example, so, you know, Western Europe, like, so France, Golic, we have a tendency to have the hips very open like this. So that means that if my hips are very open versus closed, the position of the foot to respect that angle is not the same. Hmm. So meaning that if you have very open hips, squatting with your feet straight is actually pigeon-toed ah, for a yeah, Chinese yeah. person with the, with the, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it makes so sense, yeah. It's, it's not that it is. Stuart McGill talks about this all the time. It's like some people will not be able to break parallel simply. Like, for example, some people are not designed to do uh, pistols, like one leg squats. Hmm. Like, I die. For me, it hurts my hips. Oh, my. It's so bad. I'm the typical Golic person. My hips are super open and arch at the same time. So, you know what I'm really good at? Carrying weight. Strong yeah. man. Because I'm always in a power position. You know what I'm going to suck at? Reaching depth on the squat. Yeah. Similar. Because I'm similar. Because yeah. it opens my hips even more and cranks me down even more to the point where my hips are not in a position to do so anymore. But at the top of the squat, I can do whatever I want because I'm in the power position. Yeah. Yeah, I know you've, you've uh, given a lot of good ideas with the squatting. I'd love to get into upper body just a little bit too to kind of carry this over. And you mentioned like swimming. So I, I, one of the things I saw with swimmers, and I'm sure everybody who's taught anyone to push up has seen this pretty rampantly, is like the T. Like everyone, like especially swimmers, like their elbows go straight out. So they're like a T. And I mean, that's more, I'm just trying to think of what's happening, like from the AB adduction. So I get those good, but it's, it's kind of like right. a, a mix of things, but I, I am curious what like, like a, a freestyle would be more internal rotation, whereas a backstroke the is kind of more ex, external, like. No, because they're going to go this, but to get out of the water, but the <clears> second they're in the water, you come back in. So inter- no matter still, what, you're an internal torque. Still yeah. internal. You're an ah. internal torque the whole time, yeah. Remember, what matters is inside the water. And inside the water, one does this, the other one does that. No matter what, you're going toward the center of the body. You still, so the only one is this one, right? You can go. Oh, breaststroke. Um, yeah, breaststroke. The, 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 the breaststroke yeah. is a little bit different. Oh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. even this, you're trying to stay, you know, you're going back this way. But this one is you going here, but you're going back in right away yeah. to push out. So most of the time, you're internal talk. The only time is you're here, but then you come back this way, then you push this way. So most of the effort is still done in internal torque. Okay. Yeah, it makes I mean even too, like I know like sprint breast strokers at least, they usually have pretty well developed pecs. Like distance maybe a little bit right. less, but you yep. wouldn't find a good sprint breast stroker. So at least especially on the men's side that doesn't have like very exactly. strong pecs. Even and look, sprint look at the look at the butterfly. Butterfly is out, but then once you come back in, it's all internal torque. And yeah. look about that upper back shoulder width development that all the butterfly specialists have. That was my uh, that was my swim was a butterfly. It's because I have the, the broad shoulders, but I had that, you know, the capacity to get out of the world very easily and then to bring back this way with the lats very, very well. So I have massive, like, terrace major. That's all basically internal torque. Mm-hmm. My thing was that because I had such strong pegs, terrace major, bringing the water back this way was I just, I could move forward. So I was very good uh, at butterfly because of that. There's a 
body type for weight, obviously. Always in a sprint. Always. Yeah. It's, Never long distance. Yeah. Never. It's, it's so interesting. I, I love the idea of more you understand about this and you see body types and you see how someone's built. At totally even absent of the weight room because I think it's good to take the weight room out completely because again preconceived notions squat deadly, yes. whatever like how did your body end up looking like it is and then now that I see that and know it I can actually program your weight room better because I don't want to program the weight room yeah maybe a little balance here you know we'll give you like you said like we'll balance internal and external but if I'm giving you a lift repeatedly that is working the opposite muscle chains or at least like the other direction right. that's probably not going to be that helpful for you and what am I balancing for, by the way? Because, like, for example, my favorite sports were strongman, Greco Roman wrestling, stuff like that. I have a big upper body, I have skinny legs. That's a family. My father was built the same way. All the men in my family, we have skinny legs, right? So I could squat 550, but it was out of hip power, not leg power, I got to tell you. No matter what, my legs are small. But if I do anything, my back gets, you know, mm-hmm. rose up. So guess what I'm good at? Strongman. Because all strongmen have huge backs, not necessarily big legs, right? So. Let's say I go in the weight room, it's like, oh, we have to give you more legs. All right, but then we're not going to work what I'm good at, which is carrying weight, the farmer's wall, lifting stones, all the stuff that I'm good at because I can use my back strength. So centered means uh, balance, means balance based on the person's goals and natural abilities, right? We have to respect whatever you're good at, allow you to be better at that, and making sure you don't suck at anything, Yeah. right? But in the weight room going like, oh, we need to balance you, there's a fitness industry as, as well. Most coaches have a preconceived idea of what an athlete should look like. That's very dangerous mm-hmm. because, trust me, none of us look the same. Like, there's so many differences on that one. Like, for example, my, my wife cannot develop her lats. I mean, she does, but comparatively speaking to how her legs are developing or glutes or stuff like that, it's ridiculous. So, for example, she has big biceps, but the lats are lagging. I have a lot of lats, but I have very much lagging biceps. Because I use my lats, not my biceps. She uses her biceps, mm. not her lats. Well, but there's a body type. So how much energy am I going to spend on the lats versus what's going to help her? Let's say she does CrossFit or sprinting or whatever. That should be part of the conversation as well. Preconceived notions are very, very dangerous. You should squat this way. You should like. The, you should look mm. this way. This is where coaching needs to go. Okay, who am I looking at? Stop teaching the squat. Teach that person to squat. That's what matters. Now, the downside to that is going to require you to be better, to be more knowledgeable, and to learn your craft a little bit more precisely. That's the downside, is you're going to have to know more. Yeah, so just, just centering around the squat, and maybe we, get, we can close out with this. I think this would be yeah. a good like, practical thing to kind of finish yeah. off on, is how to determine how some, a body wants to squat. I mean, if you just had them pick up a sandbag, I guess that'd be a pretty easy way to look at some things. But right, yeah, so how do you, yeah. let's, do, let's, do a sandbag, let's do a barbell back squat. Well, let's see what happened then. Let's do a sandbag squat, first thing. And let's see where the difference is at the hip level. Because if there's a massive difference on how the hips behave, it'll tell you that weight on the upper back is a problem. We need to squat that first. We need to fix that. So maybe your carries for strongman or whatever, but it tells you like we have an upper back factor within the back squat. Let's say our goal is to improve the back squat with a barbell for whatever X reason. Let's make sure the structure of the upper back can take the weight first of all. After that, I have a person squatting. All right, so rule of thumb, let's add the ankle below the knees. How about that? Not inside, not outside. So you're going to have to start playing with the foot position. Then you're going to have to see if you turn the feet out or not, or if you keep it straight. The first thing I'm going to go is like, what looks more natural to the person? The least amount of movement I see, the shorter I see the movement be, Usually, the better it is. You see that the top squatters, the top deadlifters, the movement looks short. Did you ever see the top sumo lifters? It looks like they're moving four inches because they're so efficient in their movement. A good squat is an, is an efficient squat. So if you have to do six movements on your squat, usually there's a problem. So I'm going to position your feet in a way that I see you going. Eh, eh. I mean, the least amount of movement possible. If you can come down, you break parallel, you go back up, and I don't see things moving anywhere, then we're doing good. So usually I start with the stance. I start with the barbell versus the sandbag, always to see. And I'm looking at the sandbag, and I'm going to go heavy on the sandbag because usually that's going to correct your stance. The second it gets too heavy, if your stance is too narrow, it's going to drive you forward. So you're going to have to expand your stance. 
But if your stance is too wide, your adductors can't take it. And so now you can't come down. So as I make them squat heavy, naturally they find a stance. After that, I look at where their foot positioning is, and I'm going to try to take that tension that I did on the heavy sandbag squat, and I'm going to try to find that tension on the barbell back squat. Mm -hmm. So because of the problem with the barbell and the skill involved in that, then we're going to have to have that conversation talking with the athlete saying, okay, how does that feel? How about a little bit wider? How about a little bit narrower? How about you turn the feet out a bit more? Let's see what happens. Do you feel your glutes? Do you feel the hammies like you did on the sandbag? So, and if they don't, we go back to the sandbag, we find the tension, we go back to the barbell, we try to apply it the same. What I want is I want the tension of the sandbag to, on the hips to feel the same as on a barbell back squat. I love that. It just the, the thing about feeling too, it's like everyone wants to say, hey, do this. Very much nah. less is feel this. Yeah. And I just had a uh, right. podcast that went out with a pitching coach who, who operates on the feeling of the throw. And, and it's just something you don't hear. Connecting feelings, connect, yeah. connect the feeling with this exercise, with that exercise. It's something that I think we rarely do, but I feel like that's how we kind of do things automatically. That's how we're kind of wired to just, even without a coach, used to, I'm just anyway. doing yeah. it on my own. Yeah. Do you remember when you, that day where you had just a great day at the gym and then you do a clean and then... You finish the clean, you don't even know you did it. You know, like you finish the clean before even remembering you started, and you go like, oh, that felt good. Right. I don't have to explain to you. That's the correct technique. Right? Like, you know, yeah. you were like, oh, that felt so good. All right, that. Let's, yeah. Whatever that was, let's do that again. Obviously, that's a lot easier mm -hmm. said than done. But that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to duplicate and replicate whatever it is that you found on that movement and do it every time because chances are that's how we're going to make progress. At some point, it ha the, the lift should feel good because coordination gets in, you, in, you have the right attitude and everything. I know, let's go the other way. If movement feels like shit every time, how good at it are you going to be? Let's put it this way. Because, you know what I mean? Over, over long periods of time, come on. You're not going to be successful. Like, if every time you sprint or you jump, it feels like shit, like, you're never going to be good at it, ever. I've never seen a, an athlete telling me that they ran fast feeling like shit. <laughs> Every time they're like, oh, I was in a flow. I didn't even feel my feet touching the ground. I was on cloud. That, that. They all give you a different sensation or whatever. But you can tell it was almost like a drug. Like, oh, mm -hmm. my God, I felt so good. Yes. Yeah. And then that, that brings relaxation. That brings that parasympathetic side. If you have to fight every step, and every step is like, oh, never heard someone getting a PR this way. I'm sure it happens here and there, but you, in the long run, that is not a winning formula. Yeah. To say like, oh, this is the technical model. Do it this way. But the athlete's like, I don't know. That didn't feel good. Versus like, oh, uh, like, in one Keep of the, doing it. Yeah, yeah. Just one of the, versus the athlete who found the thing that felt good. And they're like smiling. My, um, a mentor of mine in biomechanics who, who taught me most of how I observe sprinting locomotion when he works with athletes, one of the common things he talks about is their smiles. Their smiles because they felt something they resonate with. That that's like, yes, I right. I feel right. this, I get this, and right. it's just not. And you see, a, a knowledgeable coach will always go that that one. Yeah, <laughs> what was that? Like right away, like what was that? What what did you say? So I wanted to be a pro pool player as well. That's another podcast. It's a long story. <laughs> but I was practicing with Alex Lilly, who was a world champion. He was my coach for a year. And like I had some few good runs and he was like, what was your mindset before the run? How did that feel? How, why were you in that mindset? And every time those were the conversation was like, how come you were the way you were? Not like, you know, your thumb was on the correct yeah, position yeah. on the stick or the stuff. He wasn't, he was none of that. It's like, where, what was the mindset? Where were you at? You as a person, when you played that way, a good coach will go like, will look, for example, at the smile going that. I don't care what that was. Do it again. That's a good coach. And that's a coach who is not bringing his own ego into the equation of saying, you're going to squat my way. Or your squat looks like shit, you make me look bad, so therefore we're going to change it. Because there's a lot of that as well. Yeah. There's a lot of coaches who, who know once, one form of squatting, therefore their athletes will squat like that. That's very dangerous. That's ego. And unfortunately, that's, that's rampant in the industry. And that's a problem. Like, they just they need to know more because what matters, again, is not you. Is the athletes. And so you have to teach that person to squat. So the smile, I like that. The way an expression of the athletes after a good squat will tell you a lot on how they should be doing that. It's the person, man. At the end, that's who you're training. It's a person. Like that whole idea that there is a way to squat is an absurd argument. 
Yeah, it's like you said before, you're not just training, you're not training a, a body, a set of levers, you're training the mind, yep. the body, everything, and it all fits together. The person, yeah, and, and by the way, no one ever got strong at one session. If you want to get strong, it's five years, let's be honest, right? At least two years. I don't care. And even if you want to be decently strong, it's two years. I don't care where you start, it's two years of work, right? That's a lot of sessions. Even if you squat once a week, that's still 100 squatting sessions that have to be heavy and done well. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of hours spent in the gym. You know what I mean? Like your attitude has to be the correct one every time. Like I was talking about Michael Meng, my client, you know, like uh, he came, by the way. So from 60 to 65, right? He came three times a gym, three times a week to my gym. In five years, he missed maybe 12 sessions. I kid you not. And every time he left the gym, he was like, I am so happy. By the time I'm 70, I'll, I'll have the body I always wanted. He was just so positive out of every single session going like, oh, this is great. I'm a little bit closer. Like, by the way, I can't teach that. That was him all the way. But that attitude was the reason that he kept coming back and that he kept making the progress. I got someone who was 65 again, 80 kilos, 180 uh, pounds sent back, squatted for three reps, 13 pull-ups, 30 unbroken push-ups at 65 with no athletic background whatsoever. That's pretty damn impressive. His attitude toward lifting was everything. So guess what, what I made him do? Every time he didn't like an exercise, we didn't do that one. Yeah. Because I couldn't force him because he didn't come from a training background. He doesn't know what it's like to grind through that stuff. And it was too late at 60 for me to teach them. So I was like, all right, which exercise he seems to like? And that's what we're doing. That's why when we did the barbell back squat, he looked uncomfortable, the movement looked like shit. I was like, we'll never do that again. The sandbag works, that's what we're doing. For him, he doesn't need anything else anyway. Yeah. So did I feel guilty about only making him squat the sandbag? A little bit. Because I was like, really? Like you're paying me three times a week and all we're going to do is a sand Yeah. But guess what? He got results. So at the end, it's about him, not me. Yeah, it is, it is funny too how, I'm sure we could keep talking about this forever, but like with you with the mm -hmm. back squat, like yeah. someone like that who isn't good at it, how a lot of people would just settle for, ah, we'll still do it. Just do it lighter. You know, it's like, no, find the thing you're good at and rock right. that, you know? Because 80 kilos, by the way, you know what I made sure? I made sure his hips are so strong. If he falls down the stairs, he's not going to break everything mm -hmm. in his body. Like he looked like he was going to do when I first met him. By the way, he was doing one push-up. So his shoulders were hurting or whatever. At the end, 30 and broken push-ups. I don't have to fear him walking around, carrying groceries, going to ski, mm -hmm. doing whatever he wants to do. And that was the goal because he's, he had the kid late. So he had to be able to be in shape for his kid through for like, you know, the next 10 to 15 years to be able to go play soccer with a kid, whatever it is that he wanted to do. I gave him that. And that was what he was asking for. I mean, I gave him. He worked yeah. to, to get it. But you know what I mean? Like, that was the goal. The goal was not to go barbell back squat lighter with an empty barbell. That would not give him. Mm -hmm. What would I give him? Explain to me what that would give him versus a sun back squat. So at the end, it's Dagobah, man. It's be careful of the dark cave. It's whatever you bring with you. Do not bring yourself with you. When it comes to stuff like that, you only know one way of squatting, learn another one. Yeah. You do it. You go learn a powerlifting. If you know how to lift Olympic weightlifting, go learn powerlifting style, low bar squat, wider stance, go use your hips. If you only do that, then go, le go learn Olympic weightlifting. Go, go learn the sandbag squat. Go learn. That's your job. That's your responsibility to know more than one form of squatting so that you don't pigeonhole your own people into it. Ego is a bitch. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, and I'm I'm stoked. I've taken up the sandbag recently. It's been such a good like just yeah. my own feel of that movement. It's mm -hmm. been awesome. So exactly. Hey, so Julian, if uh, people want to find more about you, um, your social media or anything else you're you're offering, uh, where can they find you? Uh, Strong Fit One on uh, Instagram, and then on there they can, I can actually I'm on Mighty Network, which is some type of a private uh, social media platform where I hide from the world. <laughs> but basically, if they go on Strong Fit One, they, if they go on my bio, they, there's a link to all of that. So they can find me uh, over there. Sounds good. Well, hey, thank you so much for being on the show. It was great talking to you. I can't wait till next time I get yes. to go throw a sandbag around. So I appreciate it, man. For sure. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to the show. If you want to help us out, you can leave us a rating or a review on iTunes, Spotify, whatever you're listening to the show on. I definitely appreciate it. We'll see you all next week.